Hi, and welcome to episode seven of Talent Acquisition Trends and Strategy. Today, we are welcomed by Nate Guja. Nate, how are you doing? Hey, buddy. It's good to be here. It's good to have you. And before we jump into some of the topics that we were talking about prior to this call, it'd be great if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm the co-founder of a company called Before You Apply. Uh, we are we're a platform. We're a services company. Um, in, in short, what we do is uh, we come in, we ask teams that are hiring really tough questions. We package that up in consumable content and we help those teams distribute it out to reach hard to hire candidates. Um, so we're very much like this combination of like a tech platform with creative services behind it. Um, it's kind of an interesting combination, but um, it's caught on and, and uh, it, it, it's been fun. It is, it is catching on. It's definitely caught on and you, you are making waves and uh, you're becoming very well known in the tech community. And I've definitely loved following your content over the past. Uh, I think I've been following your content probably now for at least a year. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, I've been uh, posting, geez, I started posting on LinkedIn probably like two and a half years ago. Um, yeah, man, it's just kind of become a thing. It's, it's, uh, it, it, not what I expected, but it, but it's cool. It's really cool. Um, so, so we both work with a lot of startups and growth stage companies. And I think from different points of impact, we have a very similar goal, right? Which is how to, how to help our, our clients hire, attract uh, yeah. top talent in today's market, which is very competitive. And I, I think to just start us off, I would love to just get a pulse on, you know, what are you seeing out there? What are, what are um, companies struggling with? Maybe is one way to answer that. Or what are the biggest opportunities right now is another way. I'm just curious to get your thoughts high level on what you're seeing out there in the market. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, you know, it's great that I th think we kind of share a common audience. Um, you know, this like startup growth stage kind of tech space. And um, I mean, geez, man, they, you know, they hear the thing that we hear you hear is just like hiring is really, really hard. It's, you know, it's always been hard in this space, but it's like really hard right now. Um, and so when our, when our customers come to us, they, they need a way to show that they're, that they're different or show their unique personality or like somehow differentiate themselves from all of the other startups that they're competing with. Um, and so, I mean, that's just the thing. And like, I, it's the realities is the realities of this space is that we're dealing mostly with scrappy teams um, they're small, they're often like under-resourced, um, and they're like hair on fire, big hiring goals. And they're like, okay, we want to be doing more of this content stuff. We believe in it. We want to like get more branding, more messaging, more information out, but we just like, don't know how to do it. Can you help us? And, um, you know, that's like where we come in. And I know like that's some of the problems that you guys are solving yourselves. And so um, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a unique space for sure, because it's like this combination of like openness to new things and like wanting to evolve, but at the same time being so damn busy, like how do you fit it all in? Mm -hmm. so. Right. Yeah, I, I definitely, uh, I, I think just getting back to busy, particularly when it comes to some of what I know your team is, is doing, which is helping uh, guide the strategy and execution of, of content for hiring teams. Yeah, that is, a, that is definitely uh, something that companies I think need additional help in terms of bandwidth for, because who, who does that, right? Like the, even if you have an internal recruiter at an early stage, they're so busy just trying to keep the pipeline strong that um, maybe they don't yeah. feel based on the, the outcomes that they're expected to hit they may not necessarily feel empowered to, okay, let me hit pause for quite a while and, and work on developing these assets. Uh, it's, it's really, it's not realistic. Um, and yeah, I mean, especially like at the earlier stages, which is, you know, something that we've seen as of, uh, as of late is that we're having more early stage companies come to us. And it's usually the, the recruiter who is coming to us and saying like, Hey, like I, I saw you on LinkedIn or like, I found out about you through our VC or whoever it might be. And, um, 
like we, we need help because this is going to like enable me as the recruiter when I'm reaching out to candidates to have like an asset to share, be able to tell our story better, whatever it might be. And then, so, so you have that, right? You have this busy thing, but then you also have the, the challenge of coordinating stuff internally, getting founders on interviews, getting engineering teams on interviews, like all this kind of stuff. Like there's a lot of moving parts and like for, for that to just fall on a recruiting team is like, it's a really big ask. Um, and so, you know, figuring out like how to do that or, or, or leveraging somebody like us, like, you, you know, is usually, that's usually why they come to us. It's just like, okay, can we like just bring you in to like manage the situation and to like to get things done for us for us quickly. But like, I, I man, I, I have so much empathy for recruiting teams. I really do. I mean, they're, they're just like, that's a heavy lift. You know, you have like, unlike, unlike sales or unlike marketing, which like recruiting is a combination of both. Yeah. Sales has market yet. Yeah, right. Like, especially now. So you have sales has marketing and marketing has sales, but recruiting doesn't have anybody. And, and I, and you know, this is where, this is where I'm going to get like, you know, opinionated. But um, I think for even, even for recruiting teams at companies that have, let's say an employer brand person or an employer brand team or somebody with the title recruitment marketing, I really don't think that, that those functions we can call them um, or those roles are doing anything to help recruiters these days. I really don't. I mean, I, I've talked to enough recruiters and just asked them point blank, like, is, is employer branding helping you do your job better or easier or faster or have better conversations? And they, they, they repeatedly tell me it's not. Hmm. And so, you know, I, I think I told you, you know, I mentioned this before we hit record, but like my thoughts on this space have like evolved quite a bit about this. Where does, where, where does marketing your company to candidates and recruiting like wh where where does that line up where does that align and i think like in for the longest time there's been this this conversation of employer branding going on and then there's this been this reality of recruiting and it seems to me like those con those conversations have been going in opposite directions and i think that what employer branding has done as an industry has been um, not serving the people that they claim to be serving, which is recruiters. And so recruiters are just like tasked with like, shit, we got to figure this out ourselves. So, so what does the disconnect look like? What are the, what are the biggest things that you're seeing right now that maybe people feel like is impactful, but actually is not, it's not actually driving hiring outcomes or even, even really awareness or, I mean, like what, what, what are you seeing yeah. right now that's broken? Okay. So I think employer branding gets really stuck in strategy mode. Um, because I've been part of those, I've actually been part of those projects, you know, before, before you, before, before you apply, <laughs> um, I was part of an agency and, uh, we actually like, we built our company inside of the agency and, and that agency started off as a content studio, um, in San Francisco, creating content for recruiting teams. And then, it, and then it expanded its services into like employer branding services. So like, I've been part of these like big, you know, employer value proposition projects and, and things like that. And like, they are, they're very intensive from a time bandwidth standpoint. Uh, they're very expensive. Uh, and they take a lot, they just take a very long time to not get to like, in my opinion, things that like really matter to candidates. I think what you end up with in, and in employer branding in general is you end up with companies talking so much about themselves and like talking to themselves. Um, it, it runs through like layers of PR and approval and the, the number of times that I've seen companies get caught up in like, what words are we going to be putting on our career site or founders at like prominent tech companies going like, oh, these are the results of like the internal like discovery work that we've done. No, I don't believe that. That's not right. You know, like just things getting blocked over and over again. Meantime, months and months and months 
and tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars are being wasted on this stuff. And the recruiting team is still sitting there going like, my job is still <laughs> just as hard or harder than it was before. I'm trying to talk to engineers, like what the hell is going on here? You know? And so, so that's where I see it. Like, and so, um, go ahead. Did you want to answer me? Or yeah, no, I was just saying, I think like the, from, from what we're seeing, um, there, for whatever reason, and it just seems so obvious, but it, I guess it really is not, um, you have to know the customer, you have to know the buyer. It does seem so obvious, doesn't right. it? It's so, so yeah. So it's like, so for, for us, I, I think why we, we have a really high offer acceptance rate for hiring recruiters for secure vision, which right now, a lot of people are saying hiring recruiters is the hardest role to hire for in this market. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and yet we have a ridiculously high offer acceptance rate. I think it's around 95% uh, for, for wow. hiring recruiters. And, and we've actually had, we had several quarters where it was at a hundred percent. Um, and we've probably hired, I don't know, close to 20 something recruiters over the, over the past several months. Uh, so it really just comes down to, we, we understand them, <laughs> you know, we really, we get them at a, a very deep fundamental level in terms of, you know, what they care about, what they're, you know, of course, everybody has different values, but you know, within the segment of the largest segment of recruiters, we know ourselves, we know our culture, and we know that speaks to a, a fair amount of that recruiter community. And we're able to everything from the messaging on our uh, careers page to the content we develop is with them in mind. Like I almost consider uh, the careers page as this is our proposal, right? Just like you have like sales proposals, right? Like this is our proposal to talent considering us but it's, it's like a core part of our culture too. And it, it really is what we believe in because when we, people interview with us, it's a very consistent message. Every, yeah. Everything that they, they, they picked up on in terms of the content that we create for them is aligned with what they experienced in the interview process is then aligned with what it's actually like to work here. Mm -hmm. And then is aligned with the feedback that's posted on Glassdoor. And that's, that's why I think it works. It's, it's not just about like giving lip service and saying, this is what people want to hear. First off, you have to know what people really want. You, you do. have to know what your culture is. Those things have to match up. And then it just, it's, it's just about from at that point forward, making sure that like at each part of the journey, candidate, employee, everything is consistent and that it's, it's a consistent experience that you're actually delivering on, which delivering on is the hardest part. It can be right because it, it can require structural change to how you, your company's organized and how you manage and lead and how you train and develop people and uh, really pushing for that for that culture that you want. But um, yeah, I, I'd say that that's probably from my perspective with the employer branding and, and just general uh, messaging and the story that you're telling. Is it is does it really resonate uh, with with the audience and can you really deliver on it? Yeah. Yeah, the delivery part, you're right, is like, I mean, geez, that's like a whole, that's like a whole other conversation. And um, I mean, I guess, for, you know, some helpful context too, is like, the things that I talk about or think about the most is, is top of the funnel. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I, I think like, there's like a whole other thing, like after, after a candidate is engaged and in a process and things like that. Um and I think, gosh, man, especially like in tech, that's where tech has a really, really like big challenge. I, uh, I had this guy put a, put a comment on my post the other day and it was so, it was so insightful. He said, you know, the big, a big challenge with, with tech is how do you move fast? You know, like the whole thing, like move fast and break stuff, but like, how do you, how do you move really fast? And at the same time, be very intentional about the culture you're building. And it's, it's extremely difficult. Yeah, I know. I, I, I don't have a good answer to that, but it sure as hell made me think. And um, because I think that's the dilemma that a lot of tech companies are in, you know, because it's like, we got to move really fast. Things change consistently. You're taking on multiple rounds of funding, more funding that comes in, the more you have to hire, the faster you go, blah, blah, blah. You know, and it's just like, that, that's like, that's the model. And at the same time, you know, like I'll never forget this. The first time I heard this was, was, uh, we were working with this big gaming company and, uh, they, they were, they were still young, but they had grown so much, you know, these companies, right. It's like, they're three years old and they have like a thousand employees, but they're still a startup. And, um, and so they said that they had grown so fast that employees, a lot of employees looked up at one point and were just like, 
who are we now? Like we're not the same company anymore that we were when we were like 20 or 50 people. I don't know a lot of the people now at this company, but we're still so young that we're, that we're a startup. It's like this like weird identity crisis that a lot of high growth tech companies go through. And I don't know, man, it's like, it's just super challenging. I don't know how to like solve that problem, but, uh, but it's something I think about. Yeah. It's uh, so uh, one of the earlier episodes we had was with uh, Steve Cadigan and he was the first uh, chief HR uh, officer of LinkedIn. Oh, so okay. Oversaw people and talent uh, as LinkedIn scaled from, I think around three, 400 people to a few thousand. Okay. Yeah. And um, so he had some really interesting insights. And of course it was like, you know, very high level, like big picture stuff. Um, but basically what he was talking through was the importance of really just make it having like what, what a people first culture means to, to, to him, which was that on leadership meetings, the, the first thing that was discussed is how do we build world, world-class teams and make sure we can continue to do that. And he basically just said that the culture was if there were other problems, other things that were broken, but they didn't solve for that first challenge first, they just want to get to the other stuff. Like the, the, the whole, every leadership like meeting was the first question they asked was, how are we doing building world-class teams? Like mm. the, just, they were, they made it a priority across, it was across like the entire executive leadership team. So I think it just comes down to, it's like, at the highest level, it's like, it's a culture of the organization. It's, it's the value and importance that they put on people. And, yeah. and do they really, do they really believe that the people are driving the, the value, whether it's a, a product or a services company, that people are obviously driving the value behind a product. So, you know, how, how much, how high on the priority level is that? Are they optimized toward that? Or do they see them as themselves as like a, a product led or an engineering led organization and maybe the emphasis is on, on more so like features or whatever, whatever yeah. else, uh, product roadmap versus just like, Hey, how do we just make sure we have the smartest, like most capable, most, uh, excited, uh, best fit individuals working, working to help us solve these problems and, and build amazing products. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, um, it's making me think that, especially, you know, for startups, it's like the one thing that's guaranteed is that things are going to change. Like. It, it is something, something is going to change, whether that means product or your market or a combination of those things or price, like things are going to change. But if you can keep that, the stuff internal consistent, people are super cool to change that. It's when, it's when things internally are chaotic and toxic or unpleasant or whatever it might be. And then you're at the same time dealing with like all of this growth and stress and change on top of it. That's when things get super messy. But like when, when, when things internally, like you're saying, like you have this, like this thing that you're always pointing towards and like, like, okay, no matter what, like we acknowledge the fact that like a bunch of stuff outside of this is going to move. But inside, we're like super focused on this because we know that if we can keep this stable, the other stuff is manageable. Right. And I think about like what I think about LinkedIn too, right? With Steve Cadigan's example is like, you know, they're one of the most successful product software companies in the world. Yeah. And, and this wasn't just, I mean, obviously his role was HR people focused, but what he was saying is that, no, this wasn't just in internal HR discussions. Like this was how the entire executive team viewed the business. Right throughout that entire phase of growth. And I thought that was just really impactful. Okay, this is obviously a, a fantastic product, right? That mm-hmm. has so many advantages and is, is doing so well, but it all, for the, from their perspective, it all came back to, or down to the team, like people that are, that are building the product and that are yeah. uh, doing revenue product engineering and all the other important functions. The focus was on building that world-class organization. Yeah. Um, yeah. So That's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really cool stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean like, you know, back to, gosh, back to like what, what can recruiting teams do? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I guess so. That's where we kind of, we started, right. It's like, um, so we kind of identified like there's this disconnect, right. Um, yeah. uh, When it comes to employer branding and, 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 uh, I guess that kind of goes off into a separate space, I guess. so, So what are, so I guess the recruiting teams that are getting it right, just kind of like circling back to on a more tactical level, like what are you, what are you seeing talent acquisition departments that are winning right now? What are they doing? What are they putting on an emphasis on 
currently. Yeah. 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 So I think um, if I, if I just like even move like beyond recruiting and just say like companies that are doing a good job of this, I think like what it comes down to is like, if, if you look at, if you just look at behavior and this is like why my, why my thoughts on this stuff are continually evolving. It's because I think our behavior is evolving as consumers of things, whatever that might be, whether it's information or products or jobs, whatever. Um, and, and so I, I look at like now where we spend most of our time, I think we, we spend most of our time, like in some kind of a feed, you know, this is like, I really like, I thought about it one day and I was like, okay, if we as people, like if depending on like, we have our personal stuff that we do and we're engaged in that. And then we are engaged in our work, but what do we do outside of those things? It's like, it's usually pick up your phone and like go into some app. Right. And then, and, and then depend, depending on, on your interests, maybe it's not exactly that, but it's probably something similar to it. Like I know like Jackson, my co-founder, he always has like hacker news up in a tab because multiple times a day, he checks out hacker news to see like what's going on there. Some people, for some people it might be Reddit for some, it might be something else, but it's, it's usually like in this structure, right. Of like feed and information. And I'm like, that's what it is now. Like that, that's it. You know, like if, if we want to get the attention and become relatable and have a level of like, I guess, personality or connection, we need to be showing up there. Mm. Um, and then, so I thought about this in terms of like hiring and I just think that the, uh, the industry of marketing jobs to candidates has been so stuck in like this strategy mode of like yeah. trying to make things appear to be a certain way, be positioned a certain way, have the right words, be like way too branded. And that's like in opposition to the way that we behave as consumers when we're discovering stuff. Um, so if we're going to discover stuff in, let's say, a feed format, then that's where recruiting teams and that's where teams in general need to be. Um, and so, and to me, what that looks like, I've, my thoughts on this have evolved too. Before I was just like, I was, I was firm. I'm like, okay, if you're going to be, if you're going to show up in the feed, you need to be like dropping knowledge on your industry. You need to be like a subject matter expert. And then I changed my, my tune on that. Like, because not everybody, not everybody is that. And, and uh, what I think is really most important is showing the personality of your company. And I came up with this term on this call I was on and I, I called it personality at scale. And I was just like, that's what it is now. It's like personality at scale. How can your company show their personality in a feed, which provides scale? and and uh go ahead i was just gonna piggyback on what you said too like it's um a lot of what i'm seeing particularly in the recruiting space is a lot of the content that is you know i think i think value is and you know obviously it's it's self it, it becomes the most valuable content is getting the most engagement people are saying yes to this they want more of it and it's so the most valuable content from that perspective of getting like the best engagement uh, the most followers seems to not necessarily be focused on being a subject matter expert, but seems to be more focused on being relatable. Um, it's relatable. That's you, what it is. Okay. Cause that's yeah, I, my perspective. I agree. Yeah. No, no, I think you're, I think you're, you're dead on. And this is like where, again, like I've kind of, I've changed my, my stance on it. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, as a recruiter, I see it, I see like the kind of things right now that we're talking about this, like, content and distribution and, and meeting people where they are and this whole thing as like recruiter enablement. That's what it is. You know, it's like the, this isn't about like flipping some switch and suddenly like driving qualified inbound software engineers to your careers. Like, come on now. Like, that's just not the way it works. But what this is about is this is about doing things consistently not just as a recruiting team, but like as an organization. And again, like, again, let's face it. I mean, if, if you have a hundred person company, 
and you have 10 people doing this, that's a lot of people amplified on social media. I mean, who are doing it at like with any level of consistency. I mean, you know, like you spend as much time in LinkedIn as I do. And like the LinkedIn algorithm, I'm seeing posts from a week ago. I really like that trend, by the way, where it's resurfacing content. It just, it, it, it's uh it's good to see. I, and that's the way it should be ultimately, in my opinion. I think it's, it's, yeah. it's a lot better this way. Yeah. And so like the ability to stay alive and like, <laughs> and out there and stuff, I mean, it, it doesn't take a, it, 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 it only takes a little to be perceived as a lot. And, uh, and so, so I think about this, like in terms of like enablement, like what is going to enable your recruiters to have, to make it like easier to have conversations with the right people, or when they do reach out to somebody, it triggers that thing like, oh, I recognize them or that brand or their people or whatever it is. And like, I, they're relatable and they're approachable and they're normal people and they're friendly and, and likable. All these like different adjectives that we can throw on top of it. Bottom line is like, cool. I'd be down to talk to them. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with you. And I actually, there's, I have uh, depending on how much time we have left, I, I have another kind of uh, relevant topic tied into what you're saying. Now, do you have, a, I just want to make sure we have enough time. Do you, do you have a hard stop at 345 or can you go a little bit over? I can go over until the top of the hour. Okay, cool. Um, if that's cool with you, because there's a totally. right now, I want to tell you a little bit about what we're working on at Secure Vision. Okay. Um, a kind of a, like a, a core objective I have for our delivery team. Um, so again, like our our delivery team is comprised of a probably around maybe just under around 30 ish recruiters right now uh, that okay. work on you know it could be product engineering, revenue, G and A, really anything in between um, for startups and growth stage organizations. One of the core metrics I'm actually looking at right now. Uh, and of course, like in addition to offer acceptance rate is I'm actually honing in and focusing on time to coverage, like time it takes to get to full coverage, which we define as four candidates actively in process being considered. Oh, wow. That's so, so we're not even okay. like necessarily looking at time to fill because our process, our thought process is like, if we can accelerate the work in that first few weeks, then ultimately that's going to set us up for success to have a competitive time to fill. So I'm really like honing in on that first, what is that first, you know, two to four weeks look like? Is when anybody else measuring like that? I'm not I'm, sure. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I've never even heard of that before. It, it uh, sounds like, yeah. I mean, it, it sounds like very intuitive. It's cool. Yeah. I, it's like, I think it's going to be good for us. So what we've noticed is that like we're we want to, to try to figure out from a delivery perspective, how can we, how can we cut down on the time it takes to get to full coverage, which we've defined as four candidates in process. We used to define it as three candidates in process. Okay. The issue with that though, is that if two candidates get cut out, then you're down to one. And then you're basically restarting your entire pipeline. So we actually adjusted it. And now we're considering it four people in process. And at a minimum standard, we're saying that we, four candidates have to be in process uh, by the time you're one month into a search. Now, this taken into consideration, it might take six candidates introduced, right? Six candidates were introduced, two were passed on. The net result has to be four or more candidates Got that are it. It. that are screened, qualified, real potential candidates that could receive an offer, right? Mm -hmm. So they're mid to mid to down funnel candidates, basically. Um, so they have to have been brought in. They have to be at the hiring manager stage of the interview process at a minimum. Um, so what we're looking at then is like, okay, how do we go about cutting down on time to coverage? Like, what's the most effective way to do that? Um, well, one, there's always activity, but that's like, come on, like everybody gets that. And the issue with that too, it's like, it's so situational, right? So searches are going to look so different. We do have like some core, uh, you know, company-wide kind of activity metrics. We're not an activity-driven company. We're a quality mm -hmm. and outcome-driven company, but we do still have some guidelines of this is probably what outreach should look like over your first couple of weeks, right? Got it. So we have that kind of stuff. But then we started thinking about how do we get a little bit more sophisticated than most other companies out there, whether it's in-house or agency side. And we really started thinking about what if we stepped back and we were like, what are the top 10 positions that we fill for our clients? And in-house companies could do this too. Like what are the top five scale positions we fill consistently? what are we doing in terms of proactively creating and nurturing candidate pools for each of those positions to develop awareness 
and value within those communities so that when we need to tap into those communities and we do our outreach, we can increase our response rate and acceptance rate so that we can then accelerate or yeah, accelerate time it takes, or excuse me, the accelerate coverage so that yeah. we can cut down on our time to coverage. Got it. So that's kind of where it's led us to now. And so now we're going through the motion of like, let's create all these different basically candidate pools. And then how can we market to those groups specifically to build those relationships proactively? So I'm kind of curious to get your thoughts on that. If that's something, you know, do you ever like when it comes to, you know, I, I don't even know if it's really employer branding, but when it comes to your yeah. approach to outreach, like getting segmented into specific communities that you're going to be hiring for at scale and, and reach out to them proactively. Yes. Um, are these just like, I, just a couple questions. Yeah. Um, are these pools, when you say reach out to them, is it like you have email addresses and you can send them information via email? Is it? I think that could be part of it, but we don't want it to be salesy or like just intrusive. We want it to be feel really natural. So we're thinking about potentially like throwing, maybe even having some like virtual events could be an option. I yes. think email outreach definitely could be a channel, maybe even like in-mail outreach. But if we could do so in such a way that like, I don't mind doing outbound and, 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 and reaching out to people, like I'm not totally opposed to it, but I just want to do it in a tasteful way that adds value at least. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's like, how do we how, know, like it, content see, for them? Yeah. Yeah. I would do, um, I love the idea of like niching down like as much as you possibly can. Right. And then doing things, doing things that are just like, inc this is going to sound like an obvious thing. Right. But it, but the funny thing is, 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 is like, it's, it's obvious, but in practice, you kind of see the opposite. Right. So like what you know, mm -hmm. what you see in like, I've like joked about this in the past, like talent pipeline is really just code word for like email list that I'm going to like blast whenever I have a job open. It's like, that's not a, right. You know, that's not, not like a nurture campaign. That's not like any of these like words that get thrown on top of the realities. And so if you want to create, because like for you, you know, that if you can like create enough value that like that this audience can like con consistently take things away like valuable things away mm -hmm. that they will like automatically connect the value with you like you don't have to like tell them anything you know like people are people are smart like they will go like oh i learned about this through this or I was introduced to the, from to this person through this person, whatever you know. Like they'll connect those dots, and so I'm a big I'm a big uh, believer in this like fireside chat I, like idea, um, this like real like intimate kind of like conversation thing where like let's say you have, you know, you have a group of uh, of engineers, for example, like. I'm not an engineer, so forgive me, but uh, you're you know, and you can bring on somebody kind of well-known, let's say like a head of eng at insert fancy tech company or something, you know, somebody who's got some status and like maybe bring another person in who's got the, you know, or somebody to like kind of moderate a conversation. And like, they talk about like a current trend going on in like this aspect of engineering or in product or how they think about like designing engineering teams or whatever it is. I mean, you could probably come up with like 50 different conversation topics. And you just like, you kind of like host these, these like little like VIP events and you go out to, to that community, but you don't make it accessible to everybody. You make it like, Hey, you know, we're going to cap this at like 25 people or something because we want it to be intimate. We want it to be a Q and a, we want it to be like very personal. And so, um, you know, first 25 people who register can get in whatever, you know, like you kind of just like make it special. Yeah. You can market that kind of thing across the board. And then, I mean, I always think about post-production content and things like that. I mean, like everything you do, you know, can be like chopped up and distributed out and like, and it could be put into like a newsletter for that community and you could like transcribe it and it could be, I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do just like off of that kind of motion, you know, but I just think about that. Like, I think about the, the how do you make something like, I guess like special. And um, it seems to me like to, to a candidate audience, 
there's a lot of like that to everybody, you know, <laughs> like there's a lot of like, oh, I'm going to like, just, you know, to everything. And there isn't enough of like uh, this, like curated experience. I agree. I, and I personally prefer those highly curated. I, I was actually just talking about this with Nick on uh, actually on the other side of the spectrum, our, our demand gen strategy uh, for a new business. And we were, were just talking about marketing and sales and, and everything tied to, uh, to, to acquiring more customers. And we talked about how, from an event perspective, that highly curated smaller group uh, is such a, from my perspective, so, so much more valuable because you, you get, you get through that initial like conversation. Everybody knows how to introduce themselves. They go through this pitch essentially like, Oh, I do this, that, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then you kind of circle around the room and then you do a few more circles and then you have deeper conversations with people sure. and you get through, you know, and you, you're within that room that, with them for like a little bit longer period of time. Uh, so, you know, we've, um, you know, I, I've definitely seen more value opposed to that kind of last approach where it's just like let's just get in front of as many people as possible it's like totally. let's, how can we create these actually meaningful relationships that it's that's uh it's a little bit more real and deeper and then that's really i think where um values created in so many different ways it is so you know many. yeah and then like you know it gives you all like i mean i think the goal probably if I know you and like the, probably the conversations you guys are having is like, well, how do we become more of like a media company too? Right. Like how do, how do we produce stuff that draws people to us and become known as like the people with the ideas or the, or, and, and, you know, you start doing stuff like this now that you're thinking about to these like, like segmented markets, um, all of that can be turned into like these little media properties. Yeah. You know, quick question. I, I, I um, one of the things that we're looking at, I've, I think I probably look at this once a year and then I usually hold off. Uh, but now I'm looking at it again is LinkedIn sponsored uh, company pages. Yeah. You can create, I, I don't know if you've uh, talked to LinkedIn about that, but basically you have, have a couple extra tabs and you can put like video content up on there and you can put, um, just a fair amount of just different content about who you are and, and what the positions, what it's like to work there. And, and you can, yeah. you can start to put that, they don't provide, I don't think like strategic guidance necessarily, but it's like, you can create, you know, based off a template, put this data in. And one of the value adds that I think LinkedIn is doing with it is that they're driving impressions uh, okay. to the company page. Now, like it shows up. So the company page essentially shows up as essentially like an ad uh, so in the corner of somebody's LinkedIn screen. So you, and then you like click on it and you get like a certain amount of, uh, like, I think it's like 19,000 impressions per month. I don't know, something like that. So I'm wondering if that's a good way to drive awareness. I mean, I was thinking about getting that and then basically creating a separate kind of page within the company page, like for product engineering, sales, marketing, GNA, and then basically having that specialized content for each of those segments uh, to just drive kind of awareness. Again, it's a little bit looser. It's not like it's, um, you know, the idea I was sharing with you earlier was it's like, there's a set list of candidates that were intentionally like nurturing that we were, we kind of know who they are versus this is like just anybody on LinkedIn kind of random people that kind of fit certain criteria will, will get these little ad boxes, they'll go to the company page, they'll get a feel for who we are. We may not have yeah. something now, but it drives awareness and brand possibly. Yeah. So the stuff that you're doing could go there, right? The, the stuff could, that you're- It could. You're, yeah, it could. I mean, it's just, I think the, the LinkedIn approach is a little different. The approach I was talking to earlier with the candidate pools, it would require like manually somebody adding yes. candidates to the pool that they've like viewed and that they've noticed like, this is somebody that we'd love to work with at some point. Yes, for sure. Versus LinkedIn, it's kind of like more of that blast kind of what we were just kind of talking about. We don't know who's going to end up viewing the page. There's like nope. certain criteria I think we can put in to target it a little bit. But as you know, there's there's a big difference from what an algorithm could tell on somebody's profile than a real recruiter that's kind of looking at all the pieces and putting them together at this point yeah. in time. You know, yeah. Can, can do a better job at that. Yeah. So um, it's funny you bring this up because I, I, uh, I haven't been paying enough attention to company pages until recently. Um, I kind of moved away from it. And, and then I've been seeing, there's been, there's been a few companies that I've become really, really, I don't know, intrigued with. So I've followed their company page 
just to kind of see like what's mm -hmm. up, you know? And I've seen their company pages showing up in my LinkedIn feed with some like really creative stuff. And I've been looking at their engagement and their engagement is really good. It's, go, it's getting better. I don't know what's, I mean, maybe people are producing better quality content or maybe LinkedIn's algorithm is being a little bit more favorable toward company pages because maybe they're trying to drive yeah. sales of their sponsored page. I don't know. I, yeah, you, it, yeah, it's probably it all of that. Um, but I've noticed that these, um, you know, these company pages have had have had personality, and then you see members of their team, you know, in the comments and stuff, and it just like it, it kind of clicked. And uh, I actually like last night, I I saw this one. I was like, man, I gotta I gotta be doing more stuff like this too with my company. Um, so I. All to say, like, I think it's a good idea because I think LinkedIn has finally come around to the fact that like company pages do matter. <laughs> right. Yeah, they do. It's just, I, you know, they did the sponsored company. They've had it for quite a while, but it never really, I think it's getting, it's starting to get better. And I think the newest iteration is intriguing. And it's the first one that it's after like a 20 minute demo, I'm kind of thinking to myself, okay, yeah, this might be worth the investment, but it's a big investment because it's not only the cost that it has to have the sponsored page, yeah. then it requires a ton of content development. And it, it's, it's obviously it's gotta be very good stuff. Um, and it requires really somebody owning it and the salary of that person, right? To, it does. To, so, so there's, there's a huge kind of, it's a huge push. And then I'm not, they don't really have a ton of data yet on what it really does. I mean, like they didn't really understand, like when I was asking the reps about like conversions and what that looks like, but it does kind of align with the overall philosophy of, Hey, let's produce valuable content and let's have it go in front of relevant people that care about that. And that's, yeah. that's going to have a return. Maybe it's not always the most immediate ROI, but it just, the logic seems like sound enough. Right. I mean, it's, it's consistent with our philosophy on, you it, know, it, just well, totally. And especially if it's, if, if you're basically like, repurposing or or republishing content that you're creating for for another group of people like why not you yeah. know that's the yeah. thing it's like because i because i think what you're what, what you're talking about with this like segmented more like personalized approach with these different pools of mm -hmm. candidates and, and audience that you have is super smart and if that stuff there can just be repurposed and like more like categorized organized yeah. whatever on, on LinkedIn page. That's yeah. We're, we're going to try it for us. And then if it, depending on how we, we, it does works for us, we'll start to roll it out into our playbooks for our clients. Uh, we yeah, usually use sure. ourselves as the we Same test things on ourselves. <laughs> we, if it works, we tell our clients, I know. But, Nate, I, you know, we're coming up on time. I I've really, yeah, really are. enjoyed this conversation. Um, Me too, so, so thank you. And I, before we jump off, I would just, could you please tell everybody where, where they can follow you, where they can find your content? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm active on LinkedIn, um, Nate, G-U-G-G-I-A. I also have a newsletter um, that is essentially, it, it is, it's the same things I post on LinkedIn. It just goes to your email address. Um, it's nateislearning.com. Uh, you can go there and check it out and subscribe if you want. Great, great. Well, Nate, thank you very much. This has been a blast. And for everybody tuning in, thank you. And we'll talk to you next time. Take care. Bye.